Good morning, church. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So good to see each and every one of you here with us this morning. If you are a guest with us, we just want to say welcome and thank you so much for joining us in our bulletin. We do have that connection card off to the right. If you would, uh, give us your information. We would love to follow up with you and get to know you. And we just so appreciate you joining us today. Uh, if you're joining us on our live stream this morning, we just want to say welcome and thank you for tuning in. Um, on our church website, which is uh, www.dwmbc.org. We have a connection card on our church website as well, if you'd fill that out for us. And on the bottom of that connection card is a spot. Uh, if you have any prayer needs or praises, please let us know. Write that right there at the bottom of the connection card. We'd love to follow up with you again and get to know you, and we'd love to be praying for you. That would be such a blessing to us to be able to pray with you and for you. In our bulletin, if you look, there's lots of different announcements uh, different ministries. I'm going to highlight what's going on this week, but make sure to read over the Bible studies and discipleship that are coming up as well. Um, first, 
We do have our WEAM board meeting today, and that's at 5 o'clock. So if you're part of the WEAM board, make sure to join them for the 5 o'clock meeting. Uh, second, we do have our grocery ministry tomorrow. We're going to be heading out to many, many homes here in the Trinity area, just taking food and showing God's love and sharing the gospel, praying with them. Come and join us. I promise you will be blessed. We'll be meeting at 9 o'clock over in front of Brookshire Brothers to pray before we start the day. Come join us tomorrow at 9 for grocery ministry. We do have our uh, grief share. They changed their meeting time, but they're meeting every Tuesday from 2 to 4 p.m. in the Family Life Center. Go and join them. It's not too late to get plugged in. We do have a March business meeting this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. That's coming up too. This uh, Friday and Saturday, we have our youth spring break camping trip. How many of you love to camp, right? Okay. How many are your youth? Quite a few. Okay. <laughs> but hey, it's going to be a great time to be praying for us. If you know of any students, maybe even in your neighborhood, that would like to come, this is a great way to get them plugged in um, just to the church. We're going to be doing a Bible study and campfire, just fishing, having a great time together this Friday and Saturday, okay? Also, it's not on here, but we do have a deacons meeting tonight as well. So deacons, make sure to mark your calendars, to get, uh, mark your reminder for tonight, deacons meeting tonight, okay? Again, a joy to be with you here today. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for this morning. What a joy and a blessing it is just to be in your house, Lord. I thank you for each of these that you've brought here, our brothers and sisters in Christ. For those who are on the live stream, we thank you for that technology. What a blessing that is. Lord, I do pray. I know there are many in our church family that are out right now just dealing with sickness and illnesses and health issues, Lord. We pray for them. We ask for your healing and for your strength upon them. We pray that you would bring them back to us very soon safely, Lord. Father, we again thank you for this morning, for this time together. Please be with us as we worship you in song and praise. I thank you for Brother Ethan and just for the choir and the band. Be with them, Lord, as they lead us in song. Father, I thank you for Pastor Greg. I thank you for the message that you have placed upon his heart to share with us from your word this day. May we listen to what you have for us. May we apply the truths of your word to our lives. And Lord, in all we do, may we just honor and glorify your name. We love you, we thank you for this time, and we just devote it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Would you stand with me and sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed? <laughs> Well, my 
seated. Christian nation. That's what some people say. Maybe that's why they often ask, why do we need missionaries here? There are places in North America where there are very few churches. People are very open to conversation, but nine times out of 10, they have not heard of Jesus. There is no pastors, there is no people can share the gospel with them. There's lives that can be made whole with the gospel. And we're watching God change people's hearts and change people's lives. But I wish people knew how many more laborers we need in the mission field, because it's more than we can handle. Church planting is hard. We just gotta work together. We can do more together than we can do apart. We need all the help that we can get, and that's what Annie does. It allows for more laborers to come here. The Annie Armstrong Easter offering unites us all, big and little, young and old, black and white. We all give because we know that when we do, our communities will look more like this. And we all give because we know there's a name and a face on the other side of that gift. This offering, this gift that we're giving to and that everyone else is giving to, it does have a face. It's my face. This is the body. This is the body of Christ. That's what any Armstrong means to me. What would you guys say with me and sing? Uh, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Carry 
Lord, I pray that that would be our prayer this morning. God, that we would realize just how much we need you. And God, that, that Lord, you're the one who created the world, created the universe, and gave life and breath to it. So God, I would pray, Lord, that we would realize how much we need you, God, and that we would go and we would share that with others, Lord. Because, God, we don't realize our days are numbered. And, Lord, and I pray, God, we, we would just know, Lord, that our days are numbered, but, God, so are other people's. And I pray you would just help us realize, Lord, that we need to share your word. So, Lord, we love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Thank you, Lord, for the choir, for the beautiful voices there that are lifting your word to us. Be with Pastor Greg as he brings us a message this morning. Lord, we pray that this offering be enough to meet the needs of the church and to further your kingdom. Lord, we, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good to see each of you here today. Please open your Bibles with me to John chapter 10. Uh, Find your spot. We'll be reading there in just a moment. Uh, If you noticed, while I was walking up, I grabbed an envelope, and it says, Annie Armstrong Easter Offering. And I, I loved the video this morning. I hear from time to time people asking why we support various ministries and missions offerings. One of the distinctive things about the Baptist, Southern Baptists in particular, is our cooperative nature. Each, each week when you give a dollar to, to the offering, part of that money goes to help spread the gospel, not just locally, but around the world. Now, twice a year as Southern Baptists, we collect special offerings. One of them is the Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. I love what the young man in our video said today, that we are much stronger together than we are apart. And I want you to think about that. As a church, we set a goal of $4,000, and that's a good amount. But when we start multiplying that by 10 churches, be 40,000, 100 churches, 400, you know, it, it just grows and grows. And I want, to tell, I want to tell you, as the video said, let's put a face on the offering. We put a face by giving and recognizing that people are sharing the gospel. They are, they are provided their, their well-being, and so to speak, their wages to go out and be able to spread the gospel without having to worry about raising money. We give so the gospel can, can be shared. So pray about your offering. You'll be seeing videos for the coming probably three or four weeks at least. Pray about your offering. Give generously knowing that every dollar that you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering goes to spread the gospel. That being said, I bet you've had time to find your spot. John chapter 10 So let's stand together and read verses 1 through 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, And leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let's let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for your word. Lord, may we, your sheep, hear, listen, obey, follow your word. We thank you that you love us so much that you do speak. When troubles are coming our way, we hear your voice warning us of those troubles. When we are in deep pits, you come to rescue us. Lord, when we are hungry for truth, you feed us. So Lord, we pray that you would feed us by your word today. I pray that each one here would examine their hearts, asking the question, do I belong to the great shepherd? And if that answer is no, would you touch their hearts today, Lord? Would you call them to you? Would you bring them into the fold? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I think about my sermons from time to time, especially when I preach through the the books of the Bible. And we've been in John for quite some time. And there are some of the sermons that I preach that are like, in your 
face a little bit, as much as I can be in your face. But this is not one of them. This is a sermon about Jesus, His love for each one of us, His care for each one of us. And even, I, I would say the sermon is directed back more to me today, in a sense, you'll understand what I mean in just a moment. As an under-shepherd, it addresses my responsibility in caring for you. Now, Max Lucado tells a story of when he was a boy living out in West Texas. He tells of a man named Joe Albright. He was a West Texas rancher. He had a square jaw and a thick neck, and everyone out in his county, Andrews County, knew Joe. Well, Max Lucado had made friends with Joe's son. His son's name was James, and James and Max were best friends in high school. They played football together, and on one of the weeks there was an out-of-town football game, and they drove back. James had asked Max to spend the night with him, and they came back, and it was well after midnight when they arrived at, at the Albright Ranch. And Mr. Albright did not know Max's car. He did not know Max, and so Max drove up and he got out of his car, and immediately a floodlight hit him in the face. And then he saw this mountain of a man standing there, in his underwear by the way, <laughs> saying, who are you? And Max said, I tried to speak, but I couldn't. I was waiting for my friend to speak, but he didn't. A glacier could have melted before he finally said, Dad, it's me, this is my friend Max, everything's okay. And Joe Albright said, turn the light out. Come on in, boys, there's food in the kitchen. And I think about that picture, and you may have experienced something like that when you were a kid. What was the difference for Max? One moment he was being held at arm's length, and the next he was welcomed into the house. What was the difference? He had aligned himself with the Son. And that is what our, our, our message is today, aligning ourselves with Jesus. And I want you to think, I won't really have you answer to me, but I want you to, in your mind, answer this question. To be known by the Son means what for us? Someone mentioned in the first service, it is friendship. What a friend we have in Jesus. I pointed out that to be known by the Son means there is protection. We see it in our story today. To be known by the Son means there is entrance. As he was in, Max was invited in the house, so we are invited to come into Jesus. There is security. There is also abundance, as we read about in verse 10 of our passage today. I think it's very important that we, we recognize all those things and even recognize the context from which this passage is, is shared with us. And so I, I do something I don't do very often, but I, I believe this is very helpful. I'm going to read to you some from a commentary. And, and it is not, to me, heady, which we will, you know, I can get lost trying to read through some things. But this is one that's very practical. A man by the name of George Murray shares uh, this about our passage. He says the assumptions of the picture are reasonably clear. The sheep are kept at night in a fold or in a pen, either one that is erected in the open country or one in a yard adjacent to a wall. You know, and you can see that in a town even, there were pens that the sheep would be brought into. Out in the open, there were pens established where the sheep could be brought in. He continues, it is possible that several flocks share the one fold. Isn't that interesting to know? Not just your sheep, but a commingling of the sheep in the area may come together. The shepherd arrives in the morning and he gathers his own sheep. He calls to them individually and then leads them to pasture. And this is where I think it gets very interesting. And another theologian, his, his name is G.A. Smith, says, on this gathering, on this calling, and on this leading of sheep, this is what you need to know. He says... On the boundless eastern pasture, the shepherd is indispensable. With us, sheep are often left to themselves. And you know what I mean? We drive down the road, we might just see sheep by themselves. He said, I do not remember to have seen in the east a flock without a shepherd. In such a landscape as Judea, where a day's pasture is thinly scattered over an unfenced tract, 
I want you to just kind of mentally take note. It's hard to find grass. And that's what he's seen. Covered with delusive paths, paths that go in every direction, still frequented by wild beasts, and rolling into the desert where a sheep could be lost. The man and his character, speaking of the shepherd, are indispensable. Mr. Smith writes, sometimes we enjoyed our noonday rest beside one of those Judean wells to which three or four shepherds come down with their flocks. Again, mixed together. The flocks mixed with each other, and we wondered how each shepherd would get his own again. But after the watering and the playing were over, the shepherds, one by one, went up different sides of the valley, and each called out his peculiar call, and the sheep of each drew out of the crowd to their own shepherd, and the flocks passed as orderly as they had come. Do you get that picture? All these sheep have come together, and they're playing together. They're drinking together. But now it's time to go, and their shepherd goes and says, huh! And a group of, sh- of sheep follows them. They'll say, woo! And a group of sheep, I don't know if they did that, but you know what I mean. They had a peculiar call. I wanted to do the Arkansas Razorback thing, but, I, you know, but there, there's your picture. Yes, yes, I get a head shake. Your picture. Beautiful leading. Think about our scripture, what we just read. The sheep know the voice of their shepherd and they follow. And it is so important. Our number one point today is is this, our first point. We must understand the passage that we're reading in the context that we just set it in. It's very important for us to see that. But it's also important for us to see it in the context of the Old Testament teaching. Now, in verse 1, the mention of thief and robber is significant. It's right off the bat you hear that. And it is especially important to us in light of what we just studied last week. John chapter 9, the man born blind, he was healed by Jesus. And yet, we, we read these verses, 40 and 41 at the end of that chapter. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see your guilt remains. Jesus is talking about, in chapter 10, thieves and robbers. But he led right into it, reminding us, the reader, of the blindness of the Pharisees and the religious leaders who questioned the work of Jesus in this prior chapter. Think with me also of what the Old Testament concept of a shepherd was. The the shepherd was a symbol of the royal caretaker of God's people. Do you get that? God caring really for the Israelites. That was the picture. I have some references for you. The next next little thing that will pop up will be some scripture references. I didn't write them all out, but I I will read them. Psalm 80 verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, You who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. And then we have Psalm 23, verse 1. You know that. The Lord is my shepherd. What else does he say? I shall not want. So David writes, as the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it goes back to this picture that I just read. The shepherd leads the sheep to food. The shepherd leads the sheep to food. To water. Think about Jesus, excuse me, God, when the Egyptians had held Israel in captivity for so long, they were set free by God. They were out in the wilderness. The shepherd provided water for Israel. The shepherd provided manna for Israel. The shepherd provided the dove, doves for Israel. So we have that picture. Then we go to Isaiah 40, 10 and 11. Behold, The Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. We have a beautiful picture of a shepherd, a beautiful picture of his care. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But that's the Old Testament concept of God caring for his people. Now, this last passage that I've referenced for you, Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16, it is very interesting. I would recommend to you go back and read the whole chapter. This chapter is a statement. Actually, I'll say it this way. It's an indictment against the shepherds of Israel. 
Now, here's what I want you to hear. I am a shepherd, but I am not the shepherd. Who is the shepherd? Jesus. And, and so I am what you, you could call me an under shepherd very easily. I am under the, the shepherd, but I am shepherding the flock that God has trusted me to here. So even in the Old Testament days, there would be under shepherds, the religious leaders, the guides that were supposed to be there. Well, in chapter 34 of Ezekiel, the guides had not been doing their job. They had been doing wrong. Let me, let me read to you a little bit. They were condemned for neglecting the sheep, slaughtering them, and leaving them as prey for the wild beasts. Now think what we're talking about. These are men leading God's people. We're not talking now in this moment about animals. That's what was happening to God's people. The shepherds, the under shepherds that is, were taking advantage of God's people. And so God speaks out through Ezekiel in verses 11 through 16. He says, I'm going to do something about it. And this is what I'm going to do. And I'll read to you now, 11 through 16. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. That is because the under shepherds had let the sheep be scattered. I will seek them out, he says. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the prophets and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I love this part. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. He's going to give them food, providing for them once again. Verse 14, I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. They shall lie down in good grazing land. And on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. Do you know what he's talking about there? He stops talking about the sheep for just a second. He starts talking about the under shepherd and he says of them the fat and the strong because they have taken advantage of the sheep. I will destroy. I will feed my sheep them in justice. And, and it's such to me a powerful picture. Again, we need to understand what a shepherd does, the context of our passage, but then also what the great shepherd does. And these verses, these passages help to remind us of that. Why is this written? Chapter 10. If you go down to verse 10, I believe it, it summarizes the whole chapter. And we'll, we'll talk about it just a moment uh, more. The thief comes to do what? To kill, to steal, and destroy. But I have come that they may have abundant life or life to the full, depending on your translation. Jesus is speaking, and God has allowed this to be written because of the harm that was coming toward his people. We have to have our eyes opened to it. There's a teenager, and, and he had a midnight curfew. He didn't make it home in time. In fact, it was right at 2 a.m., and he began creeping up the stairs, knowing that he would be in trouble. But you know what happens when you creep up creaky stairs? You get heard. And his dad wakes up and he says, son, is that you? And he says, yes, it's me, dad. Well, what time is it? Well, before the boy had a chance to, to answer, the cuckoo clock started to go off. And he knew that he would be had. And the cuckoo clock went, cuckoo, cuckoo. And then the boy jumped in and added 10 more cuckoos. You get it? 12 o'clock. And so I tell you that to, to, just to pull this together. We are taught, or we should know from this scripture, when there is shady action, there is shady intent. Where there is shady action, there is shady intent. Jesus was pointing it out with the religious leaders that we read of in chapter 9. Ezekiel points it out in Ezekiel 34, and Jesus is reminding us, the thief, Satan, is, is their shady intent, their shady action. We need to watch out. The next thing we need to see in our passage today is this great image of the shepherd reminding us that God cares for the lost. Verse 4, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. You know, that reminds me 
of another parable that we're so well acquainted with. And just, just turn back in your Bible to Luke 15 for a moment. And in Luke 15, there are, there are three parables. There's a parable of the lost sheep, there's a parable of the lost coin, and there's a parable of the lost or prodigal son, as we call them. In verses 1 through 7, we read these words. Actually, I'll just pick up in, in verse 3. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. We, we see in this passage, as we've jumped over for a moment, the importance that God places on searching for the lost. He's making a point in his day, you who are shepherds, you who own these flocks, if one is missing, you leave the others and go and get it. And when you find it, you rejoice. Because he's been brought back to the fold. He says, we need to do that. We need what? And, and he, said, he emphasizes it this way. In heaven, spiritually speaking, when a sheep, a sinner, comes to the Lord, there's great rejoicing. Amen. Great rejoicing. And so if you're one of the, I would say most of you are part of the 99. Because you know Jesus already. So what should you be doing? Searching for the one who doesn't. If you are a lost sheep and, and God has led you here today, you don't know Jesus personally. He says, come home that, that, that we may rejoice. And, and our passage is so beautiful. All these that we read today about a good shepherd speak of how Christ cradles, Christ Jesus provides for us. And so we see that over and over again. There was a man, he was 75 years old, and he was given a plane ride for his birthday over his little town. He came from West Virginia, so he went out to the airport, got in a little, a little airplane, Travis, and went up there and rode around for about 20 minutes. And he came back down, and they said, Uncle Dud Dudley, were you scared? And he was a little shaky. He said, no, nah, but I never did put my full weight down either. <laughs> I... Put your full weight down. There, there, I, I just, again, back John 10, in verse 4, we, we read uh, of what the sheep do or, or what God does for them. While he has brought out all his own, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. He goes before us. You hear that? Where does God go? Before us. He goes before us. And his sheep follow him, for they know his voice. It's so important, knowing the voice of God. This is a reminder. There, there are times in our lives when we may not like the, the path, but we can trust Jesus because he's going he's to lead us. And, I, and I'll give you an example, I, and, and this is, you can apply it directly as you wish, but I'm, I'm so pleased with my daughter, Jenna, and, and that the Lord is using her. But probably the path that I would have for my daughter would not have her in Egypt right now. It would not have had her in various places over the years. It wouldn't have had her in uh, Beirut this past week. By the way, she says it's beautiful. Mountains on one side, the med on the other. And just so outstanding. But the path that I would have chosen for is not the path that God would choose for. And it just reminds you of it. In any doubt that I will have, any fear or any concern that I would have, I can say this. God is leading her. God will protect her. Have any of you read Alice in Wonderland? There, there's a section in Alice in Wonderland, and Alice comes to a fork in the road, one path leading to the left, the other path leading to the right. So she asks the Cheshire cat for advice. She says, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? And the cat answers, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. I don't much care where, answered Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. Y'all get that? Sadly, there are a lot of people like Alice, not knowing where they want to go, not really caring where they want to go. 
But God has a plan for you. He has a direct path for you. Don't drift through life. The truth is that God has something very specific for you to follow. Number three, go all the way to verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This verse is a contrast. It's between the thief and robber and that of the good shepherd. And we see it. And it is seen in the preceding chapter as well. I go back to chapter 9 once again. For you have Jesus the shepherd caring and giving life to a blind man. And you have the under shepherds of the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And you know what they said to him? Well, well you know what they did to him? They, they cast him out. They ejected him from their presence. Tell us, who is it that gave you sight? And he said, I told you, it's Jesus. And, and he said to them, the blind, once blind man said, do you want to know him so that you can become his disciple as well? I mean, that set them on fire. And they said, get out of my presence. Get out of my presence. They weren't giving shepherding care to the blind man. But we are taught that Jesus is our, our answer for life. He comes to give us life, to give it abundantly. Jesus comes to minister to us as the shepherd, the good shepherd ministers in our stories today, our scriptures today, and even in our commentary that we read. I close with a story about a young man named Jake Porter. He ran onto the football field one evening, and both teams cheered. And that's kind of unusual, isn't it? In three years on the Northwest High Squad, Jake had barely even dirtied a game jersey. The McDermott, Ohio fans had never seen Jake carry the ball. They'd never seen him make a tackle. Nor had they seen him read a book or write much more than a sentence. But kids with chromosomal fragile X syndrome seldom do. But Jake loves sports. And every day after his special education classes, he dashed off to practice. Some practice, maybe it was football, track, baseball, basketball. He never missed practice, but he never played either until the Waverly game. Jake's coach had made a decision before the kickoff. If a lopsided score rendered the final second superfluous, Jake would come in. And the lopsided part proved true. With five ticks remaining on the clock, his team was down 42 to nothing. Not a close game. So the coach called a timeout. And he motioned to speak with the opposing coach. And the Waverly counterpart heard the plan. He began shaking his head and waving his hands. He disagreed with something. But the referee intervened and play resumed. The quarterback took the ball and he handed it off to Jake. Jake knew what to do. He was to take a knee and let the clock expire. They had practiced that play all week. But to his surprise, his own players wouldn't let him take a knee. His teammates told him, run, Jake, run, Jake. And Jake began to run. But the problem was he ran in the wrong direction. And the back judge grabbed Jake by his shoulders and turned him around. And Jake began running in the right direction. And that's when the Waverly defense did their part. The visiting coach, as it turns out, wasn't objecting to the play. He was happy for Porter to carry the ball, but not for him just to run out the clock. He wanted him to run for a touchdown. Waverly players parted like the Red Sea for Moses, and they shouted, run, Jake, run, Jake. And run he did. He grinned, he danced, he jumped all the way to the end zone. And both sidelines celebrated. Moms were crying. Cheerleaders were whooping. And Jake smiled as though he had won the lottery without even buying a ticket. Shouldn't do that, right? How often do you think such things happen? According to the Bible, more often than you might think. Read about Jesus. Read about he, how he cares. Read about how he changes life, lives. Read about how he invests in others. What Jake's team did for him, the Lord of the universe does for us every day, even in giving us life and breath and purpose. Be a part of the team he coaches. It's incredible. 
Ask him today for salvation. If you don't know him personally, if you do, go back to what I said just a little while ago. You're part of the 90 and 9. Go get the one. Go get the one. Let's stand and pray together. Lord, we are grateful for your word. I thank you for the truth that we see in John 10. And we thank you, Lord, that you are the truth. I am the way and the truth and the life you have said. And I believe our passage today very clearly illustrates that. Lord, I pray that we would see that Satan has a plan for our lives as well. It is destruction. The destruction of families, the destruction of lives, the destruction of, of that which we hold dear. God's church. Satan wants to destroy it. But I know, Lord, you have a different plan. So I pray you would work within us as individuals, work within this church, that we might see many people coming to know you as Lord and Savior, that we might see many people who are down and out and hurting, being lifted up and encouraged by the people of God. Lord, if you've led anyone here to make decisions today, give them courage to step out. Maybe it's a young person who's never asked Jesus to forgive their sin, and they know they need to do that. They want to be with Jesus in heaven one day. Give them courage to step out. Even right now, come forward and speak with Pastor Sam. Come and take his hand and say, I want Jesus this day. There may be folks that have been led here who have a decision to make, who need a prayer of encouragement, who might need to come and pray at this altar, this privately by themselves. Lord, by your Spirit, move and give them courage to do that. We surrender to you, Lord. If you've called someone here to make decision, whatever that may be, give them courage now to step out and to share that decision with each of us that we might rejoice over what God is doing. We pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Our hymn of invitation is, I have decided to follow Jesus. What does that mean for you today? Sing the words, but also respond this day. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. No one with me. I still. I still will follow, though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back. I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back. No turning. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning. I 
still will follow Though none go with me I still will follow Though none go with me I still will follow No turning back No turning God's people said, Amen. sit down, just for a second. Y'all sit down. Y'all please be seated in my proper way. So I'm not always proper, but I was just joking. Okay, hey, good day. We're so excited. We have with us Robert and Debbie Stoddard. I'll, I'll get, y'all can go ahead and stand up now. I told them to sit down. Looking at this crowd might be overwhelming, but they, now, they, now they can do it. I will say this. Robert, do you want to share your quote real quick? Yeah, I think it was Groucho Marx who said that uh, I'm not so sure I want to be a member of a group that would have me as a member. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, Robert and Debbie really do come, but I just thought that was funny. Robert and Debbie really do come to unite with our church family. Another thing that Robert said is just looking at what this church does, ministering to others. There's love and care going out. And they want to be a part of that. So they come uh, wanting membership, desiring membership upon their transfer of letter from Sister Church. All those in favor indicate by saying amen. amen. And of course, there are no others. Gary and Chris, would you come and stand with our friends? Uh, Debbie and Robert have been attending Sunday school with the Rose and also the Vejars. And the Vejars are traveling right now. So uh, we're going to let them stand after service. After we close in prayer, would you come by and welcome them? Just let them know how grateful you are to see their decision today. Let's stand back up, and I'm going to ask Brother Rick if you'll close us in prayer. Father God, we are thankful for your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, we are grateful that this church has Father, go with us today and let us know why we are here and what our service to you should be. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.